So I said I say something about the NHS, I'm going to put enough time to do that. Um, good, okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about coloniality within our health system here in the UK. So the National Health Service in the UK was founded in 1948 to celebrate its 70th birthday recently, um, around the time that the British Empire was dissolving, and that's kind of an important fact, right? The Empire dissolves, this wonderful new health service is set up, which everybody's supposed to be able to benefit from, um, and there weren't enough people to staff it, um, so immediately labour from abroad was going to be necessary in order for this to be a viable project, um, and obviously the UK went to its colonies in order to source that labour. I'll say more about it in a moment. At its 70th birthday, you know, everywhere you look in the NHS, you see coloniality. Um, and, you know, I really feel like the modern NHS divides those who belong from those who do not belong, both amongst its workforce and amongst its patients as well. And I just want to say a little bit about how that typically goes. So, workers uh, of colour within the NHS have been described as Cinderella workers, you know. So working like Cinderella, working hard, unseen, unappreciated. Um, when the NHS was founded, as I say, it didn't have the staff that it needed. It didn't have enough doctors, nurses, cleaners or porters to actually make the service work. Um, and so former British colonies became source nations for bringing these workers over. Um, they spoke English, they were often trained in uh, accordance with British licensing standards, okay? So in a way, they were sort of the ideal migrant workers. And right from the beginning, they were treated as second-class citizens. Um, there's various studies and reports which show that even now, um, migrant workers within the NHS feel that their competency and their credentials are continually questioned by their colleagues and also by patients who will constantly assume they can do less than they can do or less well. Uh, can they point to working in less desirable places? This is a very, very common thing, okay? If you go to the big, thriving cities where everybody wants to live and work, that's where you see the highest proportions of white doctors. If you go to peripheral regions where fewer people want to live and work, there are fewer opportunities, what you see is people of colour work, uh, majority people of colour within the NHS. Um, uh, migrant workers in the NHS experience greater numbers of complaints from patients um, and from colleagues as well. They're paying us, I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment, and there's lots of evidence of job adverts um, from the 60s and 70s which were asking for British graduates only. Right, so there's real discrimination um, at that level as well. Um, and there's a couple of interesting quotes there from the House of Lords in 1961, so we coming to Burton, they're saying, the health service would have collapsed if it had not been for the enormous influx from junior doctors from such countries as India and Pakistan. So there's an awareness of the importance um, of these workers. And then Lord Taylor Harlow, they are here to provide pairs of hands in the rottenest, worst hospitals in the country because there is nobody else to do it. And that really was the reality and remains the reality. Okay, um, and you know, migrant workers and people of colour within the NHS suffer tremendous racism um, within that system. So about 41% of non-EU trained doctors that have patients refuse their care. Um, and I have spoken to countless doctors who are working now who have said this to me that either they've witnessed it happen to a colleague or it's happened to them, that a patient has said, I don't want to be treated by you, I want a white doctor. It's a very, very, I mean, apart from being an awful situation, it's also a very difficult one to manage professionally when somebody really needs medical care in an understaffed service right that moment. Um, there's a big pay gap. Um, I've outlined some of the details of that there, but it can amount to about £10,000 a year. Um, that people are losing now on as part of the race pay gap. Um, and white staff earn more than any other um, ethnic group within the NHS. And while 25% of the workforce are from the ethnic backgrounds, there are only 7% of senior managers, and that's actually going down over time, not up. Um, and I've just included some stuff here, so this is a you know, tabloid article. The NHS is still hiring Filipino nurses. Um, and then another one here, foreign doctors put NHS patients at risk, and another foreign trained medics who failed UK patients being kind of named and shamed. Um, 
And then you end up with this situation where you see so many of these campaigns where an NHS worker, a person of colour, feels the need to kind of, um, you know, justify their existence. You know, I'm an immigrant and I've done all these wonderful, useful things, please accept me. You know, um, it, you, you see this kind of thing all the time and it tells us something about where we are, that people need to justify um, their, their belonging within our society. Um, it's unsurprising then, you know, that with doctors migrating into the NHS, that other parts of the world are losing out, right? So, uh, migrant workers make up 15% of NHS staff and 37% um, of doctors. Okay, so 37% of doctors in the NHS were trained overseas. That is a huge proportion. And in 2018, half of all doctors entering the service that year were trained overseas. Okay, so this is not just something that happened around the beginning of the NHS, it's so very much happening now. Um, and it's exacerbating a really serious international care deficit, which is very uneven. So we're seeing care workers moving away from certain regions of the world to other regions of the world. Um, and so what we've got, um, two, again, two maps here, again, sort of mirroring the maps that I've already shown you. So the bottom one shows um, percentages of doctors leaving the country where they trained. Okay, and the top one shows the density of doctors within that population. Darker color means they've got more doctors. So it just seems the opposite thing. People are leaving places where there are very few doctors to go to places where there are loads of doctors. Okay, and by the way, I'm not at all pointing the finger here at these migrant workers. That's not the point of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this is an extraction of wealth from the states in which they train. Because when you train a doctor, the state, in almost every case, subsidizes that training, which means that that country is partly paid for that person to gain those skills, okay? Um, and so when we receive a doctor in the NHS who we did not train, we receive the cost of their training with them without having to have paid for it, okay? As I say, that's a neo-colonial resource extraction, and more than that, the NHS deliberately, every year, trains too few health workers knowing it's cheaper to poach. So rather than train enough people here, train fewer and bring over people whose training we didn't have to contribute to. And one of the really sad bits about all of this um, is that once these migrant health workers get here, they're unable to use the NHS for free. I'll say more about that in just a moment. They have to pay a surcharge every year in order to be as part of their visa requirement, in order to be able to use the NHS they are working within, and that also goes for their children and their partners, okay? Um, and there are so many cases, you just search for them, of families that have been split up by this. Um, because, you know, the, the migrant worker can't afford to pay that cost for all of their family. And you have to, it's not a case that you go, well, we'll just go with that healthcare, not that that would be wise. Um, but you leave the kids at home then, you know? Um, it's too expensive to bring them with you. So how did this come about? Um, well, decades and decades of tremendous amounts of racism and xenophobia led by the government and the media, a total race to the bottom, meant that it was fairly inevitable um, and unsurprising to people when in 2012, Theresa May said, the aim is to create you know, Britain a really hostile environment for illegal migration. Um, and just a, a, a short while later, the um, go home buses were driven around boroughs of London, which were known to have a high proportion, uh, a high migrant population in other areas of London. And then in 2014, in comes the Immigration Act, and that's what brings this immigration health, health surcharge that I just mentioned that migrant health workers have to pay for. And then these posters go up all around the waiting rooms of hospitals and GP surgeries. NHS hospital treatment is not free for everyone anymore. So that promise of the NHS in 1948 that it would be the for everybody is broken 70 years later. Um, we know that in its highest estimate, deliberate health tourism costs about 0.3% of the annual NHS budget. And all um, estimates, and I've done a lot of work with the numbers on this, show that the additional bureaucracy in order to make this system of charging work costs more than is being lost. So this is not about economics, this is entirely ideological. 
campaign is about showing certain people that they are not welcome and that health is not their right within the UK. Um, and I put that in there, migrants are net contributors to the UK economy. Though I always feel, why should I have to say that? Why should I have to say migrants are net contributors to the NHS? What if they weren't? It would still be the case that they ought to be able to access NHS care, right? Because NHS care is supposed to be for everybody. And so this is what the system now looks like in the UK. Um, rather than everybody being able to access NHS care for free, there's all these different categories, okay? Um, so I'm in, um, I'm in the category of being ordinarily resident. That's anyone who's lived in the UK with documentation for five years. Okay, if, you're, if, you're, if that's the category you're in, then you don't pay anything for NHS care and you get everything for free. But there are various other categories there. So migrant workers fall into that second one. They have a visa, a work visa, and that means that every year they have to pay £400 for themselves to use the NHS but quite often they're there on a five-year visa, so that's £2,000 they have to pay in order to access the NHS, and then that will be the same for all of their dependents as well. So if you brought your family over, you just think about what that calculation looks like there and why these people have, in many cases, decided to leave family members at home. So it's breaking up families. Um, and while people who have sought asylum and been granted refuge in this country, can access NHS care for free. Anybody who is a prospective asylum seeker, refused asylum seeker, or undocumented person, which amounts to, you know, almost a million people, uh, or some, something of that order, um, cannot access NHS care for free, and pays 150% of the, what's known as the standard rate in order to access NHS care. So they can see a GP for free, but it's a girl, 150% of face value. Most people won't even know what face value means because you never had to pay for it, right? I've never had to pay for it. I don't know what it costs when, when I have a medical procedure done. But if you want to know, then over here I've got the, I've pulled out the stats on maternity, okay? Um, so if you, give, if you give birth to a baby within the NHS um, and you are in the category F overseas price, which means non EU, Okay, which is all undocumented people. Um, you pay seven thousand pounds to give birth. Okay, so if you, if you if you have a baby in the UK, you pay seven thousand pounds. Again, I've done some work on this because, of course, what's going to happen is people will not have their babies for the medical setting in order to avoid the cost, which is a very very high risk thing to do. Free birthing, as it's known, okay, and driving people towards extreme measures in order to avoid paying that. And it's not that there's another way out either, because you have to pay £1,300 if you want an abortion in that situation. So if you are pregnant and you are undocumented, you have to pay. One way or another, you have to find that money, okay? Um, and if you don't, then and you do not pay back, if you have an outstanding debt two months after the procedure is done, then the home office, then the hospital will give your details to the home office. They are required to do so. So that confidentiality that is so key to that medical relationship is gone, okay? Um, and so there's some really, really big issues now. And I don't have time to explore them in very much detail, but you can kind of see the hostility here, right? Um, it would be one thing to give some, charge someone for pregnancy, but to also charge them for abortion is a very interesting thing to do indeed. It's really putting somebody in a trap, you know? Um, and it is that total race to the bottom that we're seeing across Europe. You know, we're not wanting to give any more than anybody else will give in order to deter as much as possible and create a really hostile environment for migrants who are already here. Okay, just to finish then, um, science and medicine are biopolitical. This is the message I've been trying to put across through all these kind of related examples. And I hope you can see the ways in which they are related. Health has always been used in the service of power. And as I tried to show in this talk, medical research agendas center whiteness and prioritize global norm interests. Marginalized groups are discursively and epistemically excluded. We do not have the knowledge to help global South people to be healthy for the most part. We also don't have the right language to do so either. When we're talking about these neglected tropical diseases, when students learn that term, it sets in their mind a particular view of the global south and how it has to be a very environmentally deterministic view. Colonialism, neocolonialism and racism are limiting the health of people of color migrants and global 
yourself, people. And in the UK, from what I can see, migrants and people of colour are treated as subjects of the NHS, but never citizens, okay? You can come here and you can work but you will never, you can't use the service, right? That looks a lot like being a subject of a colonial power rather than a citizen of that power, okay? You work for the power, you, you don't access the benefits within it. I think it's time that we drop the delusion that science and medicine will save all of us, okay? Um, and I think that decolonizing health requires a really radical rethinking of the role of social, political, and economic determinants of health. And I, you know, as somebody who works in a medical school and works alongside medical researchers, I really feel that process has to begin with those scientists and with healthcare professionals, because so much of that thinking at the moment is being done in other disciplines, and it really needs to be brought home, and people really need to be challenged on their own ground. Thank you very much.